and thank you, Harry, for the invitation. And thank you so much, Spencer and Megan, for rescuing some tech issues this morning. All right. Studying sacred music as a living practice presents many challenges. In this paper, I suggest that one of the strongest methodological approaches operates on a tripartite model, combining elements of phenomenology, ethnography, and theology. Sacred musics often come from religions, such that they have existing theological systems that can interact with these other approaches. So religions develop as an individual has an idea and then wants to share it with others. This is an example of the spread of Christianity. One person has an idea and then it completely explodes around as other people agree with it. But that means that these singular spiritual approaches are shared and then they're modified and they're combined into different types of systematic organization. So they tackle questions of how humans do, might, or should experience existence, purpose, and meaning. Sacred sounds come into the equation as humans reach for experiences that bridge the physical world and something beyond. Even to those who are only listening, I'll go to a blank slide so as not to distract you by maps of Christianity, even for people who are only listening, sound actually modifies your body. It rattles your eardrums, it brings your heartbeat into sync. As part of this embodiment and experience, Music can take us to a place beyond pure logic and explanation. A quote attributed to St. Augustine says that one who sings prays twice, speaks to that embodiment. The world's religions have already noticed this strong connection, such that music, chants, and other sounds center most worship traditions. Controversies over these sounds, vying to shape participants' experiences of what they do, what they might, what they should, experience, these controversies guide people on straight and true paths. And there are many controversies like this, from urban churches arguing over sonic space and overlapping bell ringing, to varying schools of Islamic law actually adjudicating musical practices, medieval shakhachi playing Zen Buddhist monks politically bargaining for musical freedom, to Orthodox Estonians insisting on singing the right way. As a result of this centrality of music in religious systems, Many theologies already have rich philosophies and vocabularies in place to address a lot of these musical practices and the way that practitioners are in communion with each other and with the divine. Logically, though, musically focused performers and scholars and theologians working within, and by within I mean they're targeting their performance and publications and scholarships for the religions that they're working within, they approach their work with the aim of advancing the systems, which makes a lot of sense. You believe in something, you'd like it to move forward and do your best to promote it. Now, this is where it gets into a little bit of a tricky relationship with the academy and phenomenology and things like that, because there's overlap and then yet there's also a bit of pushback as we try to figure out what is right and what we all might disagree with and what might be less right, we'll call it. Now, I'll be using more illustrations from Christianity than other religions because that's my area of study. Now, within Christianity, for example, in terms of practitioner scholars uh, generating scholarship, there's countless institutes of worship and seminaries and trainings that are teaching pastors and musical leaders how to engage with worshipers through music and how to help them use music to engage with the divine. There are Christian scholar musicians like Jeremy Begbie, John Whitlevet, and Mary McGann, for example, who produce extremely complex and nuanced theoretical works that apply to a variety of Christian subgroups. Their work is, however, firmly anchored within a faith-based foundation. Those are examples from Christianity. The same would be true for a lot of other world religions. Outgrowths of these traditions kind of by and for believers have taken different trajectories into more objective scholarship. Um, again, for example, has taken a typical approach in publishing one more objectively targeted ethnography for us, in effect, the academy, and then another manual for worshipers and congregations to research their own music and theology. Uh, sociologist Nancy Ammerman takes a similar tactic with her work on studying congregations. Then other projects sometimes start off a bit more objective and take a turn, as in Michael Spencer's Theo Musicology, which began in this more objective light, and then he decided through his own path that, quote, understanding and promoting 
Christian worship was to be the cornerstone of every aspect of his vocation in life and ministry, end quote. More sustained comparative work has been coming from organizations that, while tied to Christianity, are making specific strategic moves to bring in outside perspectives. For example, the Society for Christian Scholarship in Music just uh, changed the preamble this past year, embedded within other guiding statements. They used to say, quote, as scholars of Christian convictions, we are dedicated to excellence in all our work as musicologists, theorists, and ethnomusicologists. Now they've moved away from claiming Christian conviction to saying, quote, the society also sees it as vitally important to learn from scholars outside those traditions, and scholars who do not identify as Christian are welcome to join as full members. Similarly, the Yale Institute of Sacred Music was founded with a core focus on the Christian tradition of sacred music. The institute also, quote, seeks to engage with other forms of sacred art and other religious traditions. So I bring this combined approach to say that phenomenology is particularly useful to types of scholars who are interested in studying the messy realities of religious practice, as opposed to focusing on clear definitions and the axe sharp edges of religious tenets and dogmas of sacred ideals, which can be something of an issue when religious groups are looking into themselves, because people have a bit more of a stake in promoting certain ways as opposed to observing and being I mean, let's say we're all quasi-objective, yes, but being quasi-objective towards what they are studying. Since phenomenology, though, itself proceeds from a set of truth claims, most of which were developed in a Eurocentric Judeo-Christian context, juxtaposing it with theologies of sacred music makers allows everyone to learn more about people's daily lived realities of being. Phenomenology builds on idealist theories by emphasizing possibilities of individuals to have multiple perceptions and understandings, even as they adhere in a group. Rather than seeking to even out these inconsistencies, phenomenological, phenomenological inquiry puts them front and center and positions them as objects of study. Now, ultimately, the work I'm suggesting has the goal of producing knowledge about human consciousness and meaning making that's based in ethnographic fieldwork, gathered from very specific individuals within specific religious systems, but it zooms out and it processes those specific data points in a way that it can speak to human believers as well as provide information to broader questions about the nature of human experience and how an individual's experience resonates beyond themselves. So through the following two case studies about bracketing theological difference and liveness, I want to illustrate some of the possibilities of putting this type of theologically informed ethnomusicology to work. Uh, now I will note this is a slight change in topic from what I was going to originally write about in the abstract. I just got so excited about some data that I was processing from the Fez Festival that I wanted to run with that. So you get to hear about that today. In 2001, I conducted fieldwork at the Fez Festival of Sacred Music in Fez, Morocco. So over the course of a few days, this annual festival brings performing artists from a variety of global spiritual traditions in a concert format to a festival artist. Ticket-buying listeners range from well-heeled locals to international tourists. There's a range of traditions presented, from American gospel music to South African Zulu singing to North African trance music and Sephardic Jewish songs. Because of the range, that means that most of the people in the audience at any given concert are not going to be sharing the religious beliefs or cultural backgrounds of the musicians that are performing. However, most of the artists are bringing the audiences to their feet with applause, requests for encores, and when I interviewed participants, even though they were coming from contrasting religious backgrounds, across the board they reported feeling, quote, spiritually moved, quote, transported, or having experienced, quote, a connection with the divine. So this brief description for me raises, raises some key phenomenological questions about the construction of shared meanings. How are participants from a variety of belief backgrounds finding spiritual meaning in such musical events? Even tabling the musicians' perceptions for a moment, like, never mind them, just the listeners themselves. There's multiple types of collective meaning making that are happening during the Fest Festival. Due to, due to the diverse backgrounds of the participants, the same musical stimuli are resulting in the listeners formulating different stances in Harrisburg's development of the term. This process of 
involves the listeners grappling with the meaning of particular aspects of expressive culture and filtering them through their own experience for interpretation. So the Fez Festival attendees are coming from a dramatic range of Lebensbauten, but they're choosing to effectively bracket elements of the festival's performances that might threaten to be an anathema to their own religious systems. As an example from the festival, American jazz artist, jazz and gospel artist, Abby Lincoln, broke into Oh Happy Day. Now, these are not the exact hijab-wearing Muslim women that were next to me, but they looked very much like these lovely stock photo folks. Next to me, some hijab-wearing Muslim women broke into cheers of Happy Day, Happy Day, and they started singing along with Abby Lincoln, singing this American gospel song. As they were listening, these women were making individual value choices about their noises, which Hester Lowe was describing as intentional conscious acts, based on how they were understanding the object of these acts. The exact process and reasons could only be accessed through ethnographic interviews, which did not seem like the thing to do in the middle of a happy day. But, but anecdotal evidence is clearly demonstrating that there were levels of bracketing happening here as these women were developing a stance towards their actions in the music that night. The song's chorus, Oh happy day, when Jesus washed, he washed my sins away, that places a lot more divine power in Christ than most Muslim theologians would condone. <clears throat> but something, or multiple things, something was outweighing that such that these women were able to smile and clap and participate in that musical moment. In this festival setting, they were performing intentional acts of consciousness that were allowing them to participate. Now, a setting like the Fez Festival presents multiple types of sacred music to diverse listeners. It provides rich opportunities for us to investigate how listeners, and, and musicians too, we can bring them back in a bit, how are people bracketing these individual hurdles of participation? Now, this theoretical focus might center on how individuals are using their own backgrounds to navigate framing contexts in all kinds, including religious, performative, and cultural. If the musicians, for example, would normally render the music as part of a religious ceremony, close to outsiders, how does the setting of a festival stage with mostly outside listeners, how does that impact their experience as musicians and then also as listeners? On a spectrum between worship and performance, where would participants, both the music makers on the stage and in the audience, where would they understand those festival events or similarly stage events as falling, as worship, as concert as phenomenology gives us tools to investigate these types of internal mental negotiations. It helps us understand how people are framing these questions so that that helps our inquiry not just in a religious context but in the broader sphere. Now another area where phenomenological inquiry can be fruitfully applied is that of liveness. And I really am very appreciative of the wonderful discussion of docile and Anbasenheit that went before this. Guilt, you're all set up for it. So another area here is liveness. Liveness expresses a fundamental quality of being. Normally being here, a type of docile. This is a realm where music performance and spirituality and theology overlap intensely. Many sacred systems use music to interact with the omnipresent, omniscient divine with ideas about risen saviors, ancestors watching down on us, or reincarnate past lives, playing with our understanding of what it means to be human and alive, what it means to be here now. Ideas of internal life imply continued liveness, although perhaps not with presence in every area. Yet being here while not being here is also becoming increasingly common in our digitized realm with people's attention cast to iPods or Skype chat. So we're continually like, dealing with higher levels of being while not being here. Experience exists in flux between immediate realities and imagined realities and technologically mediated experience. So we'll look at a brief case study from evangelical Christianity. All right, evangelical megachurches such as Lives Changed by Christ, Lancaster, I used to be Lancaster County Bible Church, then they rebranded to Lives Changed by Christ, keeps the same acronym there. So in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, churches like this are among the fastest growing religious institutions in the United States. They're building off of conservative to moderate theology, but these churches are very eager to use popular music 
and cutting-edge technology to advance their ministries. Today, like LCBC, many of the largest evangelical churches combine live music with digital and social media. Large screens zoom into the action on the stage, streaming video and close-ups. From the band to the congregation, participants know that this video will likely be edited and posted to social media or in promotional materials, video from the worship service. <clears throat> because of this, the music is both performative and presentational, to use ethnomusicologist Thomas Torino's model. So it's both performative and presentational in that there's a clear divide between the amplified musicians on the stage and the worshipers. However, the worshipers in the congregation also have to participate, not only to make the social media look good, which is the very jaded version of understanding that participation, they need to participate so that the ritual is effective. If the people in the congregation aren't moved to singing and raising their hands in the air, the interaction would be perceived as a social and spiritual failure. And the lack of enthusiasm would also be seen as a lack of communication with the third party in the equation, understood by the folks at LCBC to be the spirit of God. Many, if not most or all, of the LCBC worshipers would affirm that God is indeed participating in the music making. And they would point to a specific biblical text from the book of Matthew saying, quote, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. This is a very different type of Dasein. For most people in worship at LCBC, their intentional conscious act of praising and song involves a complex causative relationship with the presence of the divine. So I wanted to play you a bit of an example here, which I'm going to have to hop out of the PowerPoint briefly. So this is an example of, um, of on one hand, worship at LCBC, also then, this is the video that is published to the YouTube feed, and we'll see one other way that it's used as well. So this is quite literally Sunday at the church. So what I want you to look for is both of the musicians that are on the platform, kind of hesitant to call it a stage for a number of connotational reasons, and then the way that the congregation is brought into it. that liveness has for these worshipers, how are they dealing with these technologies then that potentially impact that liveness? Okay, great. Thank you. With the technology of close-up shots projected onto big screens and the implicit social media presence during live worship services, participants are experiencing a phenomenon described by many, including Philip Auslander, uh, as mediatization. When the church's guitarist plays a riff on the big screen and live, our eyes are drawn to watching him on the screen. So in a way, when you have live plus digital, digital trumps live every time. We look at the larger, flashier, brighter, moving image on the screen. So on these theories, as the band plays, they know that too, in the back corner of their mind, if not the forefront of their mind. They know they're being filmed for a music video on social media. So they're both being there and not being there. Social media goes up on the web, they're also then selling albums right away. All of this is happening in the context of the live streamed worship service. So their being live just became also not being fully live, yet the highly mediatized 
setting of this worship service wouldn't actually allow the music to occur in any other way because of the type of genre that it is. The liveness of potential for unscripted responses is especially important in giving Christian expectations that God is actually at worship, uh, actively at work in the services. Insights, mistakes, the movement of the spirit. In these ways, live performance creates Turner, Turner's liminality and result in communitas. And failure is part of the equation. Like when a correctly rendered musical ingredient does not affect feelings and a sign of spiritual presence, as in Simon Coleman's study, quote, when silence isn't golden, on a failed charismatic worship service in Sweden. There can be a disjuncture such that the presence of the spirit, which congregations are taking as a given, is not enough to create a meaningful experience. So the phenomenological question is then how does the lack of mental liveness or the lack of presence impact people's perceptions and manifestations of the divine? So using a combined approach of phenomenology, theology, and ethnography to approach the spiritual element here can bring out layers of nuance. Although this is a theoretical move that's not often forefronted in work on liveness by Auslander or work by many ethnomusicologists, it's not present in, in Tom Torino's four-part um, model of music making, even in terms of analyzing recording and liveness. When phenomenological studies do approach liveness, they do so largely on an experiential level that focuses on human beings' lived reality without necessarily presuming that there could be an active sentient being permeating and acting upon that reality. I'm not necessarily advocating that that's the case, but it's such an interesting idea to play with when we're studying these religious communities and to take those religious communities very seriously in their proceeding from that truth claim. Both of these case studies then demonstrate how using phenomenological knowledge and language rather than relying on correlate theological knowledge to explain similar phenomena results in conclusions that are more readily applicable across broader contexts. In the first case, I was unable to interview the Muslim women who were singing along happily to Oh Happy Day, so I cannot do more than observe that they bracketed levels of potential hurdles. The gospel singer on stage could have adopted language to explain it, that Jesus, quote, opened up their hearts. A systematic theologian might have referenced natural revelation, Karl Barth, Kierkegaard, and said that the Lord was working to create attitudes of tolerance or even interest in a biblical message. A different Christian might have said, well, they were just entertained and that there was no theological content because it was just a staged festival setting that really didn't have much religious punch to it. And given that it's actually illegal to convert Muslims to other faiths in Morocco, that would be an interesting basis to proceed from. <clears throat> in both scenarios, the outcomes of the women stepping out of dogmatic Islam, the sing-along about Jesus are the same. But phenomenology provides more neutral language to talk about that event and that process. Similarly, discussions of liveness could take place within the well-developed theological discourses of heavenly time versus human time, this world and the next, but this very heavily-handed Christian theological approach would need levels of translation before its core findings could be put into conversation with analysis of different or non-Christian contexts. Understanding belief systems alongside musical systems and critically analyzing their impact forms a central part of doing solid ethnomusicological fieldwork and performing the analytical step back step away from theologically based explanations of mental structures and processes and put them into conversation with phenomenology, I feel, advances our scholarly project of understanding how <coughs> humans make meaning of the world. While it's no easy task, we must not be afraid to draw upon existing theologies from the communities that we're studying as both objects of our field research, but also as potential resources for theory. In studying sacred music as ethnomusicologists, our task of ethnographically informed analysis starts with how people interact with the tiny details of local worship and ends with conclusions sweeping enough to advance our global understanding of music, social life, and what it means to be human in the world. Thank you.